rights were a major issue during the 2016 presidential campaign, especially since one candidate was a woman and the other candidate, our president-elect, made headlines when several women accused him of sexual misconduct. The contrast could not have been bigger. Today's guest is a significant champion for women across the United States and will help us consider how to work towards social, economic, and reproductive justice for all women. Teresa Younger, became president and CEO of the nonprofit Ms. Foundation for Women, the oldest women's foundation in the United States, in 2014. Under Teresa's leadership, the Ms. Foundation launched the multimedia campaign, hashtag my, hashtag my feminism is, which uh, funded groundbreaking, founded a groundbreaking report on sexual abuse to prison pipeline, and led a campaign to hold the National Football League accountable for violence against women. The foundation also joined other leading women's foundations in the White House to announce a $100 million funding commitment, Prosperity Together, to create pathways to economic opportunity for low-income women and girls. This year, Inside Philanthropy named Teresa one of 50 most powerful women in US philanthropy. Teresa is visiting the Wilson School as this year's Connor D. Riley Distinguished Visitor. Today, we honor Riley's wife, Margaret Canella who created the fun in Connor's name. Uh, it's kind of a sad day. Normally, Margaret would be here, but she passed away just a little over a week ago. Uh, we thank her for being a very generous and loyal friend of Princeton. She received a bachelor's, art, bachelor's of Arts degree in East Asian Studies from Princeton in 1973, the first class to include women. But on an up note, we welcome Teresa to the Woodrow Wilson School and look forward to your talk. Thank, thank you. you. Well, good afternoon. Can everybody hear me OK? OK, I'm going to stand behind this podium for this part. And then when we get to the Q&A later, I will feel free to roam around, if that's OK with people. Uh, I want to, first off, uh, let you know how really excited I am to be here as part of this conversation today. And I look forward to uh, talking with all of you as this, as this conversation continues on. I was really kind of uh, thinking back to when we set the title for this, Dismantling the P Word moving towards a post-feminist society. And we, we, we had been playing back and forth with what that P word would be. So we went on for a while about that would, what that will be. And I'll explain it in my, in my comments. I really want to say I've had an amazing day and a half so far. I have another day on campus with students tomorrow. And I want to just thank the faculty and the students and the staff for their being so amazingly welcoming. And I have to say to the guides who have helped get me from place to place, uh, an extra special thank you, uh, because I have not gotten lost once, and I have shown up every place on time. Uh, and I know some of you from the community are here in hopes that I will say something profound and thoughtful. I don't know. I don't know that that's going to happen. <laughs> but I will definitely try, and I have uh, put some pressure on myself to make that happen. I think it's uh, actually fitting that I am here in, in honor and recognition of, of uh, the family that has supported this effort for so long. And a, a woman who paved ways in her own right seems so appropriate uh, that we are talking about the issues that are affecting the lives of women today. So as it was said, uh, as, as the dean announced, my name is Teresa Younger, and I'm the president and CEO of the Ms. Foundation for Women. This is the best and most amazing job I have ever had, and I've had several of them in my lifetime. 
If you are one of the students that were here, you've heard me talk about the number of jobs I have had. They are really incredibly fulfilling. I have to tell you though, but for me to give an academic keynote is just beyond belief. Um, you know, I, I really have to say, I'm an activist, not an academic. And I have the most amount of respect for those that are both activists and academics. I mean, like Gloria Steinem, to say the least, or Kim Crenshaw, or Melissa Harris Perry, all women I know, I love, I trust, and I respect. These are real thought partners for me and thinking about the academics of the work. For me, it's much more about being an activist. It's much more about driving on the ground the work that I have done from starting nonprofits that work with young people living in urban environments to running an ACLU, which I did in Connecticut and also worked at the National ACLU office, to working in state level public policy as the head of the Permanent Commission on the Status of Women in the state of Connecticut. Those were all kind of the things that I did. And then most recently now in this position as the CEO and head of the Ms. Foundation at what I think is one of the most interesting and critical times for women and this country. It's really been really fascinating for me. So uh, I'm coming into this experience and this conversation trying to be an academic, but in reality, I am an activist. Uh, and you know, you should know just a little bit about me. I grew up in North Dakota. Yes, there are black people in North Dakota. I knew you all were asking it. Uh, even yesterday when I was talking to the dean, we were talking for about 15 minutes before she said, I, I just have to go back. You grew up in North Dakota. I grew up in North Dakota as an Air Force brat. And so what I knew growing up, I knew much more about farming than feminism. And when the, word, when the letters GS came across my screen, it oftentimes meant Girl Scouts, not Gloria Steinem. That is how far my world has changed. I oftentimes speak on feminism and we'll talk about our campaign in that space. And Gloria and I have a, a very wonderful and unique relationship where I get to talk to her often and probably more than she really wants me to half the time. So the disclaimer on tonight's P words. There were a whole bunch that I was thinking of. I was thinking of you know Princeton and policy. Those seemed like easy ones. I thought a lot about uh, post-feminism. I spent some time playing with the words that started with P's that sounded like F's, like philosophy and philanthropy. I thought about partnerships. Then, of course, we got into the, like, the realities of today, and I thought about, a, about presidential politics. I also thought some about platforms, and I even thought about pantsuits when I was trying to define <laughs> the P word. All these words have a unique level of power to them. But then as I really started thinking about it, the P word that I want to talk tonight about is actually patriarchy. <laughs> oh, see, some people guessed it. <laughs> um, it is a very vague and sometimes misunderstood word. And one of the things that I have learned so often is that we have to have really clear definitions. You see, when you dismantle this word, and we need to dismantle this word in order to create a society that moves us towards a more equitable world. I'm kind of lofty like that. I kind of have big dreams that we can get to a more equitable, fair world. So the truth be told, I could sum up the whole keynote by using just a couple of these stats for you about the population in this country. Women account for 51% of the population. The United States, States ranks 28th out of 145th countries on equality for women. Now we have made huge progress. We have moved from 39 or 37 to 28. So we're not doing so bad in the world. A former Secretary Hillary Clinton became the first woman in the United States to run as a major party women's candidate. And women hold 26% of high level government jobs. That puts us 29th in the world. Well, we should keep in mind that we did have the most historic and unprecedented election of women of color elected this year, and then ever, more than ever before. But women still only make up 19.3% of, of, of congressional offices. We don't fare much better when it comes to business. In 2015, Pew actually said that women accounted for 26 women accounted for 5.2% of CEOs of major companies in this, in this country. We don't do much better on boards. We only make up 17% of boards. 
When you look at the nonprofit sector, women make up 43% of nonprofit boards. More run, women run nonprofits of a million dollars or less than any other organization, organizing component in the world. However, when you flip the number, men run more nonprofits over $25 million than anything else. I just put those together for you because when you start thinking about what this really looks like in terms of patriarchy, uh, you have to start asking yourself, what does this really look like, patriarchy? And I feel like we need to be really clear about what the definition is. If I've learned anything, it's the importance of words and definitions when we're thinking of this. So what really is patriarchy and what are we talking about when we dismantle it? Let's go to definitions. Definitions from, um, from our very own um, textbooks. The textbook says in patriarchy is a system of society or government in which men hold power and women are largely excluded from it. That seems like a really clear definition. In its most narrow interpretation, patriarchy is a consolidation of power by one group and the exclusion of the others from power. More specifically, it is an intentional, systematic consolidation of the majority of the world's power in the hands of white men. I don't couch things very nicely in ha making everybody feel really warm and fuzzy, but this full picture around patriarchy, we need to really reflect on it for just a moment. Patriarchy does not settle, the ex settle on the exclusion uh, based just on gender. It also takes an overarching approach at the, at, that, excludes, that, that also excludes based on identities. So race, sexual orientation, sexual identity, religion, and many cases, immigration status. This reality around patriarchy and why we actually need to dismantle it is really critical to assess. In fact, I actually have a poster that sits on the wall in my office, and it says, quite simply, we will uh, all be post-feminists in a post-patriarchy. I love that. It was sent to me by a, a mentee of mine who was visiting in France. I have it on my wall to remind myself that as much as I'd like to get to a post-feminist society of working towards equality, that's not going to happen anytime soon. Not until we have a real conversation around what patriarchy means and does and has done in this country and across the globe. So how do we shift the power from the hands of a few to the, those living and, can change, and those that can change the lives of all people across this country? How do we begin to move our country into a post-feminist era? So I have a couple of ideas on this, and I'd like to share them with you. First off, I think we have to define what feminism is. Um, at its core, we need to have the same definition of feminism. I will tell you this. In the first year of my time at the Ms. Foundation, I traveled around the country. I traveled uh, over 56,000 miles to talk with groups of people about what they thought feminism was. I wanted to hear their position for what was happening in the country. And so this conversation around feminism I've been having since the day I stepped foot in the Ms. Foundation office. Because let's not forget, when I got here, I knew more about farming than I did about feminism. The reality is we need to take a look at definition. So definition, again, from the Oxford Dic Dictionary says feminism is the advocacy of women's rights on the ground of equality of the sexes. Seems like a pretty narrow definition to me. As I stated earlier, the impact of patriarchy goes beyond gender or sex and is far more comple complex. So we need to address the broader issue. So at the Ms. Foundation, we've been very conscious to double down, excuse me, to double down on the definition of feminism, to actually broaden it out and figure out what it needs to be. And so what we found was that when we defined feminism to be truly inclusive and intersectional, we defined feminism as the social, political, and economic equality of all genders, all genders. You see, what we did is when I asked people about what they thought feminism was, I got a list of stories from people about what feminism was not and how it did not apply to they themselves. Um, and so I heard, from, I heard from black women 
that feminism was, and, the, and the women's right movement wasn't about them because they weren't invited to the table. I heard from lesbian women that feminism wasn't about them because they weren't invited to the table. I heard from men that women didn't want them at the table. Everybody had an excuse to not define themselves in the space around feminism. And so I would ask them, but don't we all believe in the same terminology, the same position of power around the social, political, and economic equality of all genders? And people would then start thinking about how we set the table in the same way. So we conducted a survey. When I came off the listening tour, I had lots of, of insight on what I had learned. I learned four different things. Amongst the things I learned was that actually feminism is alive and well in this country. How we define it is slightly different. And so when we asked in our survey, which was a poll that was much more reliable than some other polls that we <laughs> might be familiar with, when we asked, um, people, do you define yourself as a feminist? 16% of people said yes. When we asked if they believed in the values of the social, political, and economic equality of all genders, that number jumped. 86% said yes. So we went back and re-asked the question, do you believe that feminism is the social, political, and economic equality of all genders? The number went up to 56%. <laughs> Not as high as we would have wanted it to go, but what this really showed me was that we needed to get away from labels, but we needed to understand the value conversation in order to get to a post-feminist society. And there are lots of ways that we could have done that, but we kept asking people around the terminology of equality and equal opportunities and what that needed to look like. And in every single question, 94% of respondents said that everybody should have equal opportunities. 79% said that more needed to actually be done in order to ensure equal opportunities for women in work, life, and politics. That data was pretty interesting to us. And as I started going around the country and talking to people, we started seeing this conversation around, around feminism expand into various different circles. At the Ms. Foundation, we took a step back and decided that in order to get and take a shift from patriarchy to post-feminism, we needed to actually expand the tent and get people to understand what this might look like. What does representation and inclusion look like to actually get more people in the tent? It was pretty interesting when we started this, because as, based on the results of our survey, we decided we would approach it from a multimedia, multi-platformed campaign that looked at how we could shift the conversation around equality and feminism. In particular, we wanted to shift the image of what feminism and who feminists were, because people had an image in their head. So we all know the history around the women's rights movement and how people defined feminism as a middle class, upper middle class, white women's movement. But we knew that wasn't true. The objective of, of our campaign called My, Femini My Feminism Is was actually to take a moment and have people reflect on painting a broader, more inclusive and diversified approach to the language we were using. It was uh, something that we had a conversation with our grantees about, of which we have about 80 grantees across the country. And we asked them, what are they doing to incorporate the social, political, and economic equality into the work that they were doing? And what we got back was a really great conversation. And we started to challenge and think about how we wanted to change the conversation around what my feminism is. So what I'd like to do now is uh, to show you a brief uh, PSA that we developed on the My Feminism Is um, campaign. There, it features about 42 participants of different ages, careers, identities, orientations, races, and religions um, who considered themselves feminists. And this was not a picture we had seen previously in this conversation. My feminism is a form of faith. Feminism is a question, and the question is what truths are missing here? The act of creating who I was um, as someone who was born female was very much a feminist act. It was easy for me to be like, yes, I'm a feminist. It wasn't like a hard thing for me to say. If women aren't free, I can never be free. In the 60s and 70s, there was one way to express your feminism. And I think today, there are just as many ways as there are women. What defines me as a feminist is this core belief that all individuals, men, women, and anybody who defines themselves in between, should have access to the social, political, and economic equality 
that this world presents to us. We have a lot of videos, so <laughs> um, we're also gonna we're also gonna spend just a moment. Hold on here. Okay. Uh, so that video actually had a little person in it, had leader of the um, uh, trans community, had members of the LGBT community, had men in it, had cis men in it, um, and we felt like that was a better way of identifying who and what feminism is and was, but we also wanted to capture this very real conversation that didn't just stop at making a definition and get putting, uh, putting visuals in front of people. We actually wanted to start a conversation around feminism, a real conversation. And so I'd like to take a few moments and have you watch this next conversation um, that is going on between uh, these two men um, having a, a very strategic conversation about what feminism is to them. Um, it's between Wade Davis and Michael Danzel Smith. And um, these two men came to us and when we asked them if they would participate in this campaign that we were really excited about, we realized that we wanted them to have a conversation with each other around the definitions of feminism and how they considered themselves feminists. So let's start with that. As I become more of a feminist, um, I see sexism in so many things. How do you <laughs> balance that? I find it very hard to turn off the bra like my brain, yeah. like my, my critical analysis of everything that I'm consuming. And so it makes it difficult to sort of enjoy some things. <laughs> can't watch TV right? no more. I can't listen to music. I can't watch TV without it being like something, you know? Yeah. Like, like before, it was just like black. Like, it was just be upset <laughs> about everything. But so hip hop was cool, races, yeah. Right? And then, like, you open up and it's like, oh, there's sexism, oh, there's homophobia, and there's transphobia, and all of these different things. Mm -hmm. You're recognizing the limitations of your cultural influences. We can't uh, deny ourselves joy, right? Yeah. Like, I think any movement that's going to deny people joy is not one that's <laughs> not worth, worth joining. Yes. <laughs> but also, we have to be critical about where, how we're deriving that joy. For you, like, coming out of sp the sports world, like, how has that affected your relationship? I can't to... talk to any of my football friends about feminism, sexism, patriarchy, any yeah. of that, because they're like, come on, man, just chill out. In spaces and conversations with all men, right, the the conversations are so loaded with sexism. I mean, like, it's yeah. impossible. Sexism is probably the first form of oppression that you learn mm. you, because you mm. learn it in, in the home. You see your mother and father engage, and you see a certain hierarchy that just happens. You typically have to go outside of the home to experience racism. That was mm. something that was, I was like, damn, like, I didn't realize that I've been sexist since I was three. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know? I think it's trying to separate the fact that football is a game but people bring um, their sexist ways mm. to the, this actual game itself. And I know that's still not clean, but football is not something that I could honestly ever give up because it's it's like breathing. We start to understand racism at some point in our life, mm -hmm. but the, the interrogation of sexism, even though it's the first thing mm -hmm. that you're happens learning, happens much, like much later. Your, you, if it happens at all for some people, <laughs> right? Like, if it happens at all, we really are beholden to a sort of a, a sexist operating system in terms of, like, a racial justice lens, right? So uh, it's it's fascinating to, to think, like, yes, that that is the first yes. thing that we do learn, and we carry that with us, and we don't ever have to ask a question about it because we are an oppressed group ourselves. Yeah. It's easy to see who is on your neck. It's harder to recognize recognize whose neck your boot is on and we just don't we don't ever consider that you typically learn about slavery through the male lens like how hard it was for black men right and I remember meeting uh, like reading my first bell hooks book from yeah. margin to center when she like really highlighted what women had to go through that women yeah. got beat and had to work in the field and were raped you right. know, and had to have a baby, and had to have that baby on their back while they're actually doing it. And for me, I was like, damn, like, right. how do I keep missing 
all of these things. Well, because when we're taught about this oppression, like we're taught about like the rape of black women mm. during slavery, it's still seen through the effect that it has on, on men. men. What was the most powerful book that you read as far as like understanding of feminism? Uh, Sister Outsider, Audre Lorde, those essays just blew my mind. That really was the understanding of what intersectional means, mm -hmm. right? Like, I think having heard the word before that was like, oh, yes, we have to identify all <laughs> of these people living. It's a nice word. Them. Right. But Audre Lorde was, was like, oh, no, this is what it actually looks like. Do you think that your mother would identify as a feminist? Because mine would not. No, no. Is that, no, is that, is would, that she, interesting? She would not. See, my mother is like, the, the kind of the, the prototypical strong black woman mm -hmm. like you would think would qualify her for <laughs> for a feminist. You she's know? probably real. But but the, like very traditional in terms of her understanding of just sort of men and women dynamics. One day I asked my mom, I was like, can you imagine God as a woman? Because my mom is hyper religious. Yeah. And she was like, hell no. <laughs> and then I was like, let me ask you a question. I was like, um, is God loving? She was like, yes. I said, is God compassionate? She was like, yes. I said, is God sensitive? She said, yes. I said, that don't sound like a woman, but even that is sexist. <laughs> even when I'm trying to be like this really beautiful feminist and all these things, I can still be just as sexist as anyone else. I, I, I think it's fascinating, man. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um. So I, I, I love that. We have six different videos that we created in a conversation around feminism, and I think I think the ending statement is like, yeah, you know, it's just not easy to figure out the complexities of how a patriarchal society has actually just totally indoctrinated forms of sexism into our lives. And they, you know, they sum it up uh, amongst the best when they, when they reflect on that. That campaign, we started a year and a half ago, and I have to compliment because it was actually some Princeton students that did a whole campaign here on campus around My Feminism Is and did a whole photo campaign around it that we have also uh, talked about. But there are six videos in this conversation that talk to the various different aspects of how people and when people defined as feminists um, and what the word meant to them and what it didn't mean to them. And, uh, and, and it's a really broad range of conversations. In the first 30 days of this campaign that we put together in hopes to kind of move through the conversation, we had over 50, we reached over 135 million people in just the premise of the conversation. Which goes to the first thing I really want us to remember that if you don't see yourself and you can't include yourself in the changing of the conversation, then you won't be part of it. So adding men to the conversation was really critical. And it was in partnerships with men like these on the screen and men that participated that we started to redefine where the conversation could actually take place around feminism and moving the, the dial. So in the, in the past year, we've actually seen conversations in Ebony Magazine of all places on black men and feminism, a seven part series. We actually saw NBC itself take up a, a campaign called 31 Days of Feminism, 25 of which of those days were uh, names in or of organizational led women that were uh, part of the Ms. Foundation. We also put together and worked on a campaign called Let's Talk Feminism that allowed us to start having real conversations about what feminism could and should look like in various different communities, including partnering with the Brooklyn Historical Museum on, and Historical Society on what we wanted that feminist conversation to look like. So we have to start the conversation somewhere. One of my favorite quotes uh, in, in starting the conversation is actually from Melissa Harris Perry. And she says, feminism is a question, and the question is tr what truths are missing here? What voices are, aren't being heard here? And who isn't at the table? And that is a significant part of the work that we have done. And so when we have started assessing how we move to this post-patriarchal, post-feminist society that we want to get to, we realized that we had to actually have the power to change the narrative and to figure out what words were actually getting choose getting used when and where. I rarely talk about the women's movement, not because it's not a valid and vital thing, but moving forward, I believe the Ms. Foundation really needs to be talking about the movements that affect the lives of women, which is a slightly different approach than just talking about the women's movement. It's a far more integrated approach to the work that we want to do. 
We need to change the dominant narrative that society is putting forth to us. And they're putting it forth to us in all sorts of ways and places. And we need to continue to strive to change what that dominant narrative is. We call it disrupting the dominant narrative. And we've done it in a number of ways. A way that we have done it is by making and ensuring that those who have a voice get their voices heard and that they frame the conversation. We sometimes forget who is framing the conversation for us. We can talk about the fact that right now the media is framing a conversation around this election to be women against women, when that may not be the conversation we really need to have. So how we change the narrative and use the power of narrative to change is that we've actually supported some research that's been done. The Ms. Foundation, in addition to the uh, uh, Georgetown Law Center on Poverty and Inequality and the Human Rights Project for Girls, actually put together a report. And in that report, it's called A Girl's Story, The Sex Abuse to Prison Pipeline. It adds a race and gender lens to the conversation of mass criminalization in this country and identifies the fact that our criminal justice system, particularly when it comes to women and girls of color, starts because of sexual abuse somewhere early on in the process. Changing that narrative has actually informed a conversation around mass incarceration in this country in a way that we didn't have until two years ago. And in fact, President Obama actually spoke to this issue of the sex abuse to prison pipeline in his speech to the Congressional Black Caucus. We've also worked with groups like the Native American Women's Health Education and Resource Center when we asked them to identify issues that were affecting their community. They came to us and said, we want to put together a book of real life stories and the narrative will be this, what to do when you are raped. That language would be halting to many of us, but on many in what we realized was that the prevalence of sexual assault and rape on reservations is higher than anywhere else. In fact, it's a one to three ratio, higher than that which we hear on college campuses, and it's completely underreported. What that did was it allowed for a narrative to start an intergenerational conversation within women on the reservation to talk about what had happened to them. The prevalence of rape was not, was not if, the prevalence of rape was when, and the exchange of stories was really dominant. It's helped to address an overall narrative across the country. When we worked with our organization called Young Women United, a grantee out of New Mexico, um, they talked to us about dismantling teen pregnancy prevention. This campaign that's been going on in this country for a very long time, and we have seen a decrease in teen parents. But what that report turned out and said to us was this was not really about teen pregnancy. One of the data points we forget is that the data that was being collected by the federal government actually went to age 19, and 60 plus percent of teen pregnancies were of those uh, young women who had made decisions after the age of 18 to have children. So it changes the dynamic and the narrative. And what, what Young Women United asked us to do was to start talking about young parenting and not teenage pregnancy. It changed the way we were giving respect to those young parents who were actually seeking help. And we realized that we couldn't, as we proceeded to do this research and got the information about how we should change the narrative, that we needed to look at who was doing the research itself, which was really key to these conversations. If your researchers are all men and they're researching about men, then you're going to get one way of a story. If your research is about women and all the re researchers are women, white women, you're going to get another story. And so we partnered with the Anna Julia Cooper Center at Wake Forest University to support a conference called Know Her Truths, Advancing Justice for Women and Girls of Color Conference. And at that conference, we brought together researchers of women and girls of color from educational institutions from around the country. So working to change the narrative and amplify the voices that are critical to changing that narrative is one of the key things that we can do. And we've done it in a number of ways also. We have over 80 grantees, as I've mentioned, across the country. In addition to those grantees, we've formulated a cohort and put together a program called the Op-Ed Project, which takes women of color's voices and ensures that they know how to write op-eds so that we can get those voices moved to, into mainstream media. And they have uh, placed op-eds, over 70 op-eds have been placed in Time Magazine, The Huffington Post, The Hill, and American Prospect, just to name a few places, where voices of women of color are shaping the narrative of what needs to happen. 
At the Ms. Foundation, we fund in the areas of health, safety, and economic justice. What this op-ed project did and does is it invites our grantees to collaborate and write from a dual perspective of what's going on in their communities. So it's not just a single issue that they are coming into. One of our grantees told us, in quote, she said, I now know that I have a voice and my voice is important and I'm going to make sure that it is heard. That kind of importance in the work that we are doing to shape the narrative and get people to understand what needs to happen is really critical. The last part that I think is most important about changing the narrative and moving us into a post-patriarchal, post-feminist society is around how we invest our time, our money, and our talents. As, at the Ms. Foundation, as a public foundation, we oftentimes spend time uh, making grants. We oftentimes spend time uh, ensuring that voices are amplified and that we build on the collective power of women throughout this country. We do this at the intersection of race, gender, and class. We don't leave out any aspect of that. It sometimes makes people a little bit uncomfortable to think about what we are doing in that, at that intersection. It means that we're not just talking about women's issues, but we are talking about the issues that affect women's lives. And when we talk about those issues, we're not just talking about pay equity and abortion access. When we talk about the intersection of race, gender, and class, we're talking about the, the real intersections around education and women's health and transportation and childcare and pay equity, and the list goes on and on. And when we actually tested that conversation uh, in the same report that told us uh, much more about feminism, we found that when we asked people what were women's issues, they came out with those two pay equity and abortion. Those were the only two issues women talked about. Um, when we asked them what were the issues that affect the lives of women, we got a list of 15 issues that affect the lives of women. So one of the key things that we do at the Ms. Foundation is make sure that we don't try to mitigate everything to one issue. We need to look at all of these issues and where they intersect, how they intersect, and then we place the race, gender, and class lens over them so we can have a real conversation. It can be tough to really ask what these questions might be, but we try to do it time and time again. And in the philanthropic space, what we've said is that we need to make sure that we are holding all parts of philanthropy responsible in how we address that question around what is philanthropy, what can we be doing, and what are the intersections. Very few philanthropy, very little, uh, very few philanthropic dollars are going towards women and girls. So the race conversation totally drops off the scene. 7% of philanthropic dollars go to women and girls. If you break that down, the largest percentage goes uh, to women's health, particularly around breast cancer. So if you break it down into the other social political issues that are going on in women's lives, you're seeing a, a really small portion of philanthropic dollars that are going to women and girls, and even smaller percentage going to women and girls of color who are most disenfranchised and most impacted by the work that needs to be done. As a, as a final thing I want to mention to you, was mentioned in my bio, another P word that we have been working on at the Ms. Foundation is prosperity. How do we raise the prosperity of those who need it most? So we have put together and have been part of a group of women's foundations across the country who have come together in a project called Prosperity Together to move past patriarchy on a local level and figure out what we need it to look like and what we need to do. So specifically, um, we have asked organizations to put forth money to support this research. And last year, in conjunction with the White House Council on Women and Girls, we announced that women's foundations, public foundations, of which there are dozens across the country, but about 29 of them committed to being part of this Prosperity Together effort, um, we committed $100 million over five years to go towards helping women uh, lift up themselves with a lift, through acquiring livable wage jobs, training and education, affordable high quality child care in these areas. This, this opportunity was really geared towards low income women. Within the first year, we are really happy to announce that Prosperity Together, in addition to our coalition partners, have committed more than $29 million in the first year to strengthen the economic security of women in this country. That is money raised by women, for women, going to women, and helping out in their communities. 
It's pretty exciting that, we had see, that we've seen that and that we know we have four more years left in this commitment of what it could look like. And now, more than ever, as we all know, we're going to be needing more dollars to do more, more work on the ground in communities. So I want to leave before I, I, I um, wrap up. I just want to, and we get to questions, I just want to leave those students in the room with what you can do. Because it's been the ongoing question that I've heard while I've been here. What can I do? Well, I actually believe that public service is the highest thing that you can do. I believe that, that young people, anybody actually, needs to take a look at what is happening on municipal, county, and state level politics. This is where I believe there will be real work happening. This is where I believe we need to create the testing ground for good governance to work its way through. And that's where I think people need to spend some time and energy uh, at, um, moving forward. So opportunities like this at the Woodrow Wilson School is perfect for outlining what that needs to look like. And I, once you get into those positions of public service, however you define them, challenge what is happening. Challenge the status quo. Push to make those, and those around you completely uncomfortable with what is going on. If you don't do that, you are going to buy into a bureaucracy that can be really hard to overcome. So please make sure that you do that. Take the time, figure out what you want to do. And that public service can look like 101 different things. It can look like the ACLU. It can look like the Women's Commission. You choose how it needs to look. Find your passion and your purpose, more P words you should consider about what you want to do, and step forward with those, uh, with those efforts. That is the thing that I would leave you with. Don't be disheartened at what has happened in this election cycle and think that public service doesn't matter. Because next to military service, public service is probably the most important thing we can be doing. So I'll leave you with my favorite quote, and then I will go on to questions. And my favorite quote is this. Be the kind of, oh, don't be offended anybody, by the way. I'm going to swear. Disclaimer. <laughs> be the kind of woman that when your feet hit the ground in the morning, the devil says, oh shit, she's up. I invite you to be that kind of woman. That's the woman I strive to be every day, and I hope I'm making the devil's life really miserable. Thank you very much. <laughs>
that's why I say feminism is alive and well. It's just a determination of what we want to call it. Um, because I found that young people were completely um, engaged in what feminism looks like and, and how that de definition fit for them. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'd be curious to hear uh, where religion plays into these conversations. You've talked about a lot of different lenses that intersect with you know, movements that affect women, but I haven't heard much of religion. Yeah, no, that's a really good question because I've actually just started analyzing what that looks like, um, uh, adding a race, gender, and class lens to religion, um, because many different kinds of religion um, do and don't accept various versions of that. And so um, most people, actually, I should show it, but um, we actually have uh, um, Marsha Gillespie talking to feminism. And I, I love uh, Marsha. I'm very partial to her. She's a, a, a wonderful mentor of mine. But she, at one point, in, when we were interviewing her for the My Feminism Is campaign, she said, um, my feminism uh, is a religion. It is the core of who I am. And it's just a really powerful statement. And so I have not done a full assessment. But I do believe that social justice uh, is a core principle of the Ms. Foundation, that our definition of feminism is a social justice lens that actually gets included. And I do believe that those who are, whatever their religion is, who, however their spiritual identity is, can, can rally around that definition. We haven't done anything specifically targeted at that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I'm struck by your close connection between feminism and patriarchy. Sorry, I'm Nan Cohen from the Center for Human Values, formerly at the Women's Law School. I found your lecture fascinating, and your example of writing notes as fast as I could in the videos. But since I'm a political philosopher, I also react to your definitions. And you rightly say that words matter. But when you say that, in effect, if patriarchy is dismantled, then there will be no such thing as feminism or no need for it or whatever, which is what I interpret you as saying. Mm -hmm. Then I want to say, well, are there no needs or interests or characteristics of female members of our species that don't have anything to do specifically with patriarchy, that aren't triggered by it or blocked by it. I'm thinking about issues of voice in art, culture, literature, and not just because women have been oppressed, but aren't there some ways in which our lived experience as female might allow us to have a voice that doesn't have anything to do with patriarchy, but is distinctive, mm -hmm. or health issues, or mm -hmm. reproductive issues? Mm -hmm. I would assume that those would still matter Mm -hmm. Even if in whatever millennium we we get rid of patriarchy, <laughs> and I knew that I know they're very closely connected. Yeah. But if and when it goes away, oh, will there uh, be nothing left that we would call feminist? Um, to the to the definition that we put forward, the social, political, and economic equality of all genders. If all genders were equal in access to the political and social and economic equality, we wouldn't we wouldn't. Um, we wouldn't need the terminology of feminism. It's like saying feminism is intersectional. I believe in the definition of itself, feminism is an intersectional term, so I don't need to, re I don't need to predefine it. So um, I think one of the things I would say is it is not um, in our definition or in the way that we're talking about it does not preclude the idea that one's identity and expression um, of in art or otherwise, wouldn't need to be essential to one's identity. Like, I, I think it's, it could still be there. But in terms of how we move the pendulum, not just in, uh, in one's expression, but how we move the pendulum in the political sector or the economic sector, I think we actually um, need, to, need to maintain the language. But you don't mean that equality is sameness. No. So equality, when and if we achieve it, will have not only intersectional differences, but is there any residue of ways in which females might be different from men even oh. then? But you're saying that doesn't have anything to do with feminism. It means feminism is then sort of a defensive protest movement, not a, not a broader sort of celebration. No, no, actually I don't think that, I don't think, I don't, didn't mean if that was, if that's how it came across. I'm not sure that that's what I was, I would be reflecting on in that. I believe that feminism is, um, not a defensive protest movement. I actually think it is a progressive um, strategy to uh, put a common definition on the table for what we are striving to achieve. Um, and so uh, I think it's actually, it is a celebration because as we start to move towards that and, and 
come up with strategies and structures that get us to move towards that, we, can, we will have greater recognition of not sameness, but of, of individual identity in the process. Um, I think it, it broadens the conversation, not closes the conversation off. But in all honesty, I'll be quite honest with you, um, I can't imagine what it looks like when we get there. <laughs> it would be very hard for any of us to do so. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'll go back here and then I'll come up there. Hi, thank you for being here today. Post election, are you capturing new opportunities to welcome young people, college students, millennials? It seems like quickly there should be a new strategy to welcome people to the magazine, to online, to the foundation. Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it's, very, it's very interesting because. Uh, we actually, you know, people want to do something. So um, Ms. Foundation is not Ms. Magazine. The magazine has um, really kind of picked up. You'll, you'll notice they are, um, uh, they've got a new article, they've got lots of new articles coming out. Um, they just uh, released a document. For us at the Ms. Foundation, we absolutely are seeing a pickup. Um, the foundation is uh, a public foundation. We make grants to the grassroots organizations. And so we are seeing people who want to be active. We're an, a public advocacy foundation. And so we, they want to be active. And so we are you know, saying, find something locally. right? Find something within your community that, will, uh, that helps serve your purpose and that you can become involved in, that you can become informed about, that you can be able to talk about, that you can become an advocate for and around. And that's really important. And we are collecting that information, right? So um, we will, I think, uh, Angelique will kill me for saying this, but we're going to be coming out with a, uh, this My Feminism Is campaign is just about over a year old. And we were planning on rolling out some new components to it. Um, and uh, we will be doing some additional components around that, so I would encourage you to watch for it. This is a special issue that just arrived. There was no mention of all this wonderful work you've done. Because um, the Ms. Foundation is different than uh, Ms. Magazine, and sometimes they don't pick up on some of our work. Um, but we're in conversation with them. Yikes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you know, it, it, we're, 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 I, I, this is what I say about the foundation and the magazine. We, are we were uh, started by the same mothers raised in different houses, and our, our work is slightly different. We do communicate with each other. We, you know, sometimes they are reporting on our, the work of our grantees um, who are doing amazing work on the ground, and so we do see it there. We're still trying to figure out you know, what, we, what that needs to look like um, and how you know, they report quarterly. How do we... Um, not get people confused, but really allow people to see the work that's going on in changing the conversation. You know, many, many of the pieces that we do, people conflate the foundation with the magazine. Really great. We use the magazine as an amplification of voices. It's critical that we have those writers and those analysis of the story, and we have groups that are doing the work on the grassroots level. Yeah. I saw one more hand up. Yes. I'm curious as to why the words feminism became so repulsive to men, women, I mean society in general, right? I mean that's what's happened. That through the years and I mean people don't want to they don't want to bond to that and, and I don't understand it. Well I mean I think there's a real there really is a truly historical perspective to the language that gets used. And what we have decided to do at the Ms. Foundation is not come up with a new identity around uh, what we are trying to do. But the historical relationship to the word changes generationally, changes by gender, race, and class. And so, you know, I oftentimes, you know, we could analyze, literally till the cows come home if we want to, um, why people do not affiliate with the word, which is why we said it is our definition, it is the word that we use. We will not, uh, it is not a linchpin to a determination about whether you can participate or believe or activate the way we want you to. And that's really important because sometimes there was an ongoing conversation about the word. If you didn't identify as a feminist, you couldn't come in the door. You, you just couldn't come in the door. And that's what I heard when I was out talking with people, was this perception, whether it was reality or not, perception is reality, perception around what it was. And so what I've tried to do at the Ms. Foundation in the past two and a half years is to expand the tent, to create a tent that has three sides and a really wide door. And if you define as a feminist, you might go all the way through the tent and end up in the back of the tent and be really happy or in the front of the tent and be really happy. 
Um, if you don't choose to identify that way, that is acceptable also. But as long as we agree on the principled statement of the social, political, and economic equality of all genders, that is a place for you to come in or not. We don't want to create a door that's too narrow that people choose not to come into. So I'm trying to figure out how do we set the table, how do we expand the tent? Um, and part of that at the Ms. Foundation is around centering women of color in the conversation. It's around um, acknowledging and calling the question if and when we know what it is. And it's about uh, holding ourselves all a little bit uncomfortable so that we can move to the points that will get us to the next level. So but then what do you want to call it? I'm calling it feminism. You are? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you're not afraid that that's going to keep people from coming in the door? No. No, I'm calling it feminism and I'm defining it as I, as I talk about it. So I think it's really important that we define what we're talking about um, because people, what happened, what we found in, in when we were, you know, in our survey was people made assumptions around what the definition was. And when we clarified it for them, it changed how they identified. So I think it's, that's a really important piece is understanding the definition that you're using so that everybody can either uh, be uh, supportive of it, or they can not define that way. I saw a student say on that, but now I'll come down here. Uh, I was wondering if you could talk about some of the nonprofit and MIS Foundation supports and what kind of innovative work they're doing on the ground, and perhaps um, organizations that have uh, you guys have uh, decided to fund or have approached you for funding after widening this definition. Yeah, so um, the MIS Foundation. Uh, funds organizations through general operating supports. We have about 80 organizations across the country. And the way we do our work is to make the assumption that the organizations on the ground know uh, what the solutions are in their communities. So we don't dictate from the top down. We really let the solutions come from the bottom to us in their proposals. And, that's, uh, and we fund their general operating support. So we allow them to turn their lights on and pay their staff and do the strategy work that needs to get done. And we're seeing some really unique and exciting um, programs going on around the country. In Mississippi, uh, an organization we were funding around child care, the Mississippi Low Income Child Care Initiative, actually has been the lead voice for us in what we are now developing as a southern strategy for a women's, initi for a, um, women's economic initiative. And what they did is, as, as a um, child care provider, they came to us and they said, we will never move childcare. It's, we just are not going to get it to happen. We've tried and tried and tried. We'd like to continue to broaden the work that we do, and we want to, uh, we need your help to do it. So we helped them set a table of about 29 state organizations that came together. They talked about what would a women's economic agenda look like in Mississippi. They held eight roundtable conversations across the state of, of Mississippi, and then they had one big summit where 500 women from across the state were bussed in who were informed on the issues, and they announced an economic agenda that was reflective of the issues of the women in their communities. Um, that initiative in and of itself spurred the Women's Caucus in Mississippi to re regenerate themselves, and they have been leading the, the um, policy initiatives that have come out of this. And that group is now in their second year and they're continuing to engage on the local level and on the statewide level to move through policy. That's leadership from the grassroots up. That's following what our grantees were saying. In uh, uh, New Mexico, we have grantees who um, have worked on passing basically a Family Medical Leave Act for young, uh, for young parents um, who were, they were asking the question, why aren't young women graduating from high school? Um, and what we found were young women wanted to graduate with their friends, but the laws on the books were preventing them from graduating with friends because they were gone for, uh, they were out of school for a longer period of time than they could be. So they worked on passing legislation that created basically an FMLA, a, lead to, a leave time for young parents to take off, come back, and graduate on time with their friends. Um, and we've seen that, that kind of work happen. We have a group in California who is doing something which I find is really unique. They created an app and they have trained young people in their communities to go to pharmacies and um, they've created a report card for pharmacies. They go into pharmacies, they uh, respond to how the pharmacist reacts to them, whether the pharmacist gives them accurate information, tells them where they can find whatever they're looking for, whether it's birth control or otherwise. They have a grading system and each year they put out 
um, in the newspaper a grading system of all the pharmacies in their communities and, um, and how those pharmacies rank, what is the cost of birth control in those communities, um, how far it is from point A to point B, um, and now they've created an app for that, right? Um, so, you know, I think those are kind of some of the innovative projects that we do. We do a project in conjunction with the Parsons School, and, uh, and they help uh, some of our grantees each year um, put together uh, innovative solutions to, some, uh, to how they get their information out. Um, so uh, we've worked with a group in New York called Raising Women's Voices, and they created, when the Affordable Care App came out, they created a, a multifold um, information book about like an if-then-what scenario, so that, and it was multilingual, so that people could figure out what they were asking their doctors. Um, so those are kind of some of the work that our grantees are doing. And they're organizing things like fighting for the Hyde Amendment um, you know, in, in Washington, D.C. Um, and they're you know, organizing on the statewide level. So they're really doing some really unique initiatives. What is good about the work that they're doing is because of the convenings that we host, grantees can come together um, from across the country and share what they've learned, what they're doing, um, and they've been able to communicate really effectively with each other, and we have a very high touch. So if we hear of a grantee that wants to do something in one state and we know something else is being tested out or legislation's passing, we try to, make, we try to put those together. So we have one more question. Are you a student? Uh, no. Okay. We have, to, we have to, you know, go with students first. That's what I was told. So I just want to make sure we don't have any more student questions because I only have time for one more question. just want to ask before I go to the, the next one. Okay, so I promised you the next question. Well, um, someone already brought up the question of religion, and um, I was just rolling around my head so much how um, how much work could be done in that area. Mm -hmm. Because if you think of the major oppressors, women, religious organizations, or certainly more religions, look at God is not great, Christopher Hitchens, I mean, throughout time, women mm -hmm. have suffered. Mm -hmm. So um, how, do you, how would you go about doing that, uh, you know, that in a way that was attractive to people in churches, you know, to get involved somehow um, with bringing up the whole topic of how women are, actually, are treated in general or even specific to their own church. Okay. I'm so, thinking of the you know, Catholic church for one. Yeah, so some of the places, you know, we can't be everywhere. Um, but one of the things we are doing and that we have done in uh, this past year has been where there have been um, philanthropic institutions are coming together that, that fund religious organizations. We've been at those tables and asked the question about the intersections of race, gender, and class and talked about the importance of what we are doing and how we might be able to create mechanisms together. Um, when I say we haven't come up with any answers, we're not funding in that space, um, but we are trying to figure out, you know, how do we hold other uh, in philanthropic institutions accountable for what they are doing in that space? And, um, and so that's where we're starting the conversation. Uh, you know, Ms. had done work in that space prior to me coming on board. In the past year, I have stepped forward and, you know, we've, I've been to two of the convenings that have gone on that have brought, to, brought together the philanthropic sector to talk about what that could and should look like. And that's our starting point, which is to change uh, how people are reflecting on these issues. So I actually, since I answered that really quick, I'll go to you and then I'll wrap up. Well, thanks. Um, well, I'm really just inspired by your work. Um, I would echo Nan a little bit in the sense that um, with, when you're engaging people to sort of reconnect with feminism or to think about it as a much bigger tent, mm -hmm. why then think about post-feminists, right? I mean, let's, it, it, let's embrace it and, mm -hmm. and not think we're going to get beyond it necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, but I did also want to ask about um, when I saw you know, the basketball player, I immediately thought my adolescent high school age nephews could connect with that. Mm -hmm. And if I try to talk to them about feminism, they're going to go. <laughs> <laughs> but if I show them that, they're going to connect with that. Right, right. And it actually reminded me of the Emma Watson He for She campaign, mm -hmm. which again, I spoke to my teenage daughter about feminism. Ah, oh, mom, you know. <laughs> and then she sees this and it's like, isn't this great? Right, you know? right. So I'm just curious are you using other public figures that really can connect and why it's the tent? Yes, uh, yes we are, and <laughs> um, I'm just going to find, let's just see if this is it.
Um, yes, we are. And you know, we have a Men for Ms. campaign that we do, um, which is in the process of being expanded uh, in, this, in, this in this vein, right, right. Of, of who is the messenger for what you want to talk about. Um, and you know, we have seen that conversation go on. We're seeing an, an uptick, if, they, if we can say that, in um, feminist clubs on high school and college campuses. Um, you know, I get invitations all the time to come speak to high school campuses about feminism and the importance of equality. Um, and, and, you know, those conversations are a little different than this one, but, but they are, you know, they are really to help drive that conversation about who the voices are. And so I want to show you the longer version of the video just because I think it's really worth seeing and we'll wrap up with that, which you'll see some of the voices uh, and the um, level of, of, I think, hopefully thought partnership we've put into who's carrying it. And now we have even more influencers out there and, uh, and they're carrying the message. So like uh, Matt McGorry is one of our influencers who's participated with the Ms. Foundation in a number of ways. He's on how to get away with murder and Orange is the New Black, right? So we are trying to figure out who carries those voices and what does that need to look like. Um, and it was uh, Wade Davis who did the, um, who did the whole campaign on Eb with Ebony Magazine on black men and feminism. So we're open um, constantly uh, to it and, uh, and we'll see what happens. So let's wrap up with this and I thank you all very much. People have their own impression of what feminism was about. Many people oftentimes felt that the word itself left out the history or left out individual voices. And it was oftentimes defined in the media <coughs> by white men. And at the end of the day, when I look at myself in the mirror, I'm a black woman. And I didn't quite know where I fit in that. Feminism at the beginning profoundly makes people uncomfortable. In fact, I never identified as a feminist. And it's largely because I guess the images I had of what a feminist was growing up were um, really these images of, of white women and privilege. The act of creating who I was um, as someone who was born female was very much a feminist act um, that was on the shoulders of so many freedom fighters. <laughs> In the 60s and 70s, there was one way to express your feminism. And I think today, there are just as many ways as there are women. As a woman with a disability, traditional white middle class feminism never worked for me. Because I was never going to be equal to a white man. We all come to the table with our own stories. You know, we bring, I want to call it our personal histories, and we often bring the collective histories of whatever tribe we come from with us. Feminism is a question, and the question is what truths are missing here. And so in that sense, my feminism is always um, intersectional, because intersectional feminism is to always ask what truths are missing here, what voices aren't being heard here, um, who isn't at the table that you don't even realize um, is not at the table. 21st century feminism really needs to center those most impacted and look at all the conditions that women face. I was raised by a feminist. I was raised not to be a feminist, but to have a level of understanding of human interaction and human justice. And I think being in that environment, it was easy for me to be like, yes, I'm a feminist. It wasn't like a hard thing for me to say. When I go throughout my day, I really try to align my politics using an intersectional feminist lens, which means that I make decisions on, is this good for a poor black woman? What defines me as a feminist is this core belief that all individuals, men, women, and anybody who defines themselves in between, should have access to the social, political, and economic equality that this world presents to us. What makes me a feminist is that I understand that um, if women aren't free, I can never be free. You know, as a gay man, really understanding that that their struggle is actually my struggle too. The feminist values that I want to raise Sarah with are an understanding that every single person is equal. My feminism is a form of faith. It's a form of faith. It is having the faith to believe, do you know what I mean, that women are whole, complete, you know, human beings and should have all the rights and privileges of you know every male human being on the planet.
Feminism is the social, economic, and political equality of, of all genders. All genders. All genders. Thank you very much.